Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jackson, this is the scientist who killed millions and saved billions by the channel Veritasium. Fritz Haber is the scientist who arguably most transformed the world. Okay, yeah, Veritasium is a great scientific channel. I've seen few videos, reacted to few videos from this channel. I guess this is the latest video. Just I think it was uploaded what an hour or two ago. I don't know, but yeah, when you know, people might have noticed that whenever there's a science video, right, I upload too quickly. Yeah, because uh, my favorite topic is anything science, right? I love history and gaming, everything. But yeah, science is like, uh, if I'm going to watch this, let's just make a reaction. That's what I think. So let's watch it. Remember, if you like my reaction, no phone, like, subscribe. Check out the reaction. There's a link in the description. Check out the cards. Check out the link cards in here. The 1918 Nobel Prize for Chemistry is probably the most important Nobel Prize ever awarded. It was given to German scientist Fritz Haber for solving one of the biggest problems humanity has ever faced. What? His invention is directly responsible for the lives of four billion people today. But when he received his prize, many of his peers refused to attend. Two other Nobel Prize winners rejected their awards in protest. Why? And the New York Times wrote a scathing article about him. He is simultaneously one of the most impactful and tragic scientists of all time. Perhaps more than any other single person, he has shaped the world we live in today. Part of this video is sponsored by Ren. More about them at the end of the show. If you are an American citizen and you find an island with a lot of bird poop on it, well then you can claim that island for the United States and the US will have your back. The president is authorized to send in the Navy and the army to defend your newly discovered poop covered island. There are currently okay. 10 American islands that were claimed in this way. And even though the law that made this possible was passed in 1856, it is still in effect to this day. So why did people want poop covered islands so badly? Fertilizer? What? It's fertilizer. There are a few dozen islands off the coast of Peru where millions of seabirds gather to mate. And the waters near the island are full of fish. And these millions of birds eat the fish and then they poop. A lot. Since the region is hot and dry, this poop solidifies and accumulates over millennia. There are cliffs of bird poop 30 meters or 100 what? feet high. Technically, bird poop is called guano, and by the mid 1800s, buying and selling bird guano was big business. The price rose as high as $76 per pound meaning you could trade four pounds of guano for one pound of gold. So why was there such a big market for bird poop? Oh my God, a gold is equivalent to four bags of literal shit. <laughs> well, to answer that, we have to look I inside the human body. By weight, most of our bodies are made up of oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen. But the fourth most common element is nitrogen. Nitrogen is part of the amino acids that form proteins. It's yeah. part of hemoglobin, the compound that carries oxygen in red blood cells. And it's a central component of DNA and RNA. Nitrogen is essential for all life on Earth. We get our nitrogen by eating plants, or animals which have eaten plants. And plants get their nitrogen from the soil. The problem is, if you farm the same soil year after year, you harvest the nitrogen out of it. And eventually, there isn't enough nitrogen for healthy plants to grow. Mm. They can't produce enough chlorophyll to photosynthesize, which stunts their growth. Their leaves turn yellow, and they are more susceptible to pests and disease. Crucially for farmers, nitrogen deficiency means smaller yields. The way to fix this is to add nitrogen back into the soil, which is where bird guano comes in. Guano is up to 20% nitrogen. 
Hundreds of years ago, Incan farmers realized that adding guano to their soil made crops grow taller. This is what allowed them to grow food in places that were previously unfarmable and expand their empire. South America's rich deposits of bird poop did not go unnoticed by the rest of the world. In 1865, Spain went to war against its former colonies of Peru, Chile, Ecuador, and Bolivia for control of their guano-laden islands. Mm. But such was the world's appetite for nitrogen that by 1872, guano was running out and Peru banned further exports. The world would need another way to get its nitrogen fix. This was a crisis. William Crookes, a British chemist, made a dire prophecy in 1898. With the world's growing population and dwindling supplies of nitrogen, he said, we stand in deadly peril of not having enough to eat. In less than 30 years time, he argued, people all over the world will be dying of starvation. But he also proposed a solution. It is the chemist who must come to the rescue. It is through the laboratory that starvation may ultimately be turned into plenty. Okay. Because here's the thing. Nitrogen isn't rare, it's common. 78% mm. of the air is nitrogen. But it's in a form that plants and animals can't use. Two atoms of nitrogen triple bonded together. This bond is one of the strongest in nature. The way to measure the strength of a chemical bond is by the amount of energy that's required to break it. So to break apart two chlorine atoms, for example, would take two and a half electron volts. To break apart two carbons requires 3.8 EV. Two oxygens, 5.2 EV. But to break apart two atoms of nitrogen requires 9.8 electron volts, mm. a tremendous amount of energy. There are two processes that do this naturally. Mm. Lightning releases so much energy, it breaks apart N2 into individual nitrogen atoms. They then quickly react to form nitrogen oxides. And these molecules stay in the atmosphere until they react with water droplets in clouds and fall to the ground in rain. There are also a few types of bacteria living in soil that can break the N2 bond, using a tremendous amount of energy to do so. And they make nitrogen available for plants. What? But bacteria? Man, I love how, how our ecosystem works, right? Rain, basically, rain and thunder basically make sure that soil gets, you know, littered with nitrogen again, so it doesn't, you know, soil doesn't get uh, empty of nitrogen all over the place, right? So it's a cycle of, you know, replenishing. Obviously, bacteria helps as well, so the whole system just perfectly works. Every time I see something like this, it's just like, you know, I don't know why it surprises me, right? I mean, uh, obviously ecosystems, that's why all this life has survived for this long time, but still. Only replenish the nitrogen slowly, and there's not enough lightning to produce nitrogen compounds at scale. Mm. So chemists tried. In 1811, Georg Hildebrandt mixed nitrogen and hydrogen in a sealed flask, trying to make ammonia, one of the nitrogen-containing molecules found in guano. When that didn't work, he submerged the flask 300 meters underwater to increase the pressure. And that didn't work either, but he was on the right track. Increasingly sophisticated versions of these experiments were carried out over the following 100 years. All of them failed. So when Fritz Haber became interested in this problem in 1904, he was joining a long line of failed chemists. Okay. He was 36 years old, working as a low-level academic at the University of Karlsruhe. He was also a new father with a two-year-old boy named Herman and a wife, Clara, who was one of the first women to get a PhD in chemistry. Damn, Driven right. by pride and competition with another scientist, Haber spent five years on the problem. His idea was to combine nitrogen and hydrogen not only at high pressure, but also at high temperature right. and in the presence of a catalyst, something that lowers the amount of energy required to split diatomic nitrogen. To do this, new experimental apparatus had to be invented. 
Haber worked tirelessly on this project, building equipment that could tolerate ever higher temperatures and pressures. He also got lucky. At the time, he was moonlighting as a technical consultant for a light bulb manufacturer. So there he had access to lots of really hard to find materials, mm. like the element osmium. Osmium is rare. In his day, there was only about 100 kilograms of the refined metal in existence. But the company he worked for was experimenting with using it for filaments in their light bulbs. So they had most of the world's supply. Okay. Hopper suspected it might make the perfect catalyst, so he brought a sample back to his lab. And there, in the third week of March, 1909, Haber placed his sheet of osmium in the pressure chamber. And then he pressurized and heated the nitrogen and hydrogen to 200 atmospheres and 500 degrees Celsius. Under these conditions, the triple bonds broke apart and nitrogen reacted with hydrogen. Of the total gas mixture, 6% turned into ammonia. Okay. When the gas was cooled, one milliliter of ammonia dripped out the end of a narrow tube into a beaker. An elated Haber rushed from one lab to another, yelling, Come on down! There's ammonia! Germany's biggest chemical company, BAS... So let me get this straight. I mean, only way he could have done that is if he had worked on a, you know, light bulb maker, like he said. So... Basically, or like he said, it's, it's just by chance. So if he, he was not working for that company, right? Are you saying we would never have discovered this? I mean, how many accounts like this exist with scientists? Like they were just at the right moment, at the right time, at the right place for sudden discovery to happen. This kind of, a, you know, butterfly effects are really, you know, heavy when you really think about it. Things that transform the world will rely on small things here and there. If they had changed, right? I'm not saying that this never would have been discovered. Like, I guess eventually somebody would have. But yeah, still. SF commercialized Haber's process. Within four years, they had opened a factory in Oppau, producing five tons of ammonia per day. People spoke of making bread from the air. Okay. With the fertilizer from this industrial process, on the same plot of land, farmers were able to grow four times as much food. And as a result, the population of the earth quadrupled. There's a good chance you owe your life to Haber's invention. The earth supports four... Okay, I don't get this. So why do people hate him? Why they didn't attend... Uh, the, you know, the Nobel Prize event, right? Why did people wrote things badly? Because apparently he did something that nobody could, right? He apparently discovered a way to create ammonia. What's the problem here? Billion more people today than it could without nitrogen fertilizer. In fact, around 50% of the nitrogen atoms in your body came from the Haber process. The invention made Fritz Haber a wealthy man. He got a promotion, becoming the founding director of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Physical Chemistry in Berlin. Kaiser he Wilhelm, also okay. befriended some of the best scientists of his day, including Max Planck, Max Born, Einstein. and Albert Einstein. After Einstein separated from his first wife in 1914, he stayed the night at Haber's house. But if Haber was so well regarded, why was he shunned by colleagues when he won the Nobel Prize? Exactly. Well, it all comes down to what happened in World War I. Okay. When the war broke out, Haber volunteered for military duty. Unlike pacifist Einstein who denounced the war, Haber was a patriot. He wanted to use his expertise to help his country. Only a few months into the war, oh, the no. German army was already running out of gunpowder and explosives. Oh no. Ammonium nitrate. Oh no, don't tell me that he uh, he's the one who invented, you know, some kind of a attack gas or something, right? World War One is known for mustard gas and shit like that. Don't tell me he's the guy. Besides being an excellent fertilizer, is also an explosive. Just look at what happened in Beirut in yeah. August of 2020. A warehouse containing almost 3,000 tons of ammonium nitrate caught fire. 
and in the extreme heat, the fertilizer detonated. The blast, which could be heard hundreds of kilometers away, killed at least 217 people and injured thousands more. Seismometers registered an artificial earthquake measuring 3.3 on the Richter scale. This is just one of many fertilizer-related explosions. Damn. The Oppau plant where Haber's process was first put into practice would also explode in 1921. And the reason is nitrogen. We've already seen that it takes a tremendous amount of energy to break apart nitrogen's triple bond. But the flip side of that coin is that when two nitrogen atoms come together and form that bond, a huge amount of energy is released. Mm. The explosions of gunpowder, TNT, nitroglycerin, and ammonium nitrate all form diatomic nitrogen gas as a product. And the formation of that triple bond is where these chemicals derive much of their explosive energy. Haber lobbied to convert the factories using his process to make ammonia for fertilizer to create nitrate for explosives instead. His superiors believed such a conversion to be impossible, but Haber persisted, and soon his chemical process was at the heart of the German war machine. From bread out of the air to bombs out of the air. Hmm. Yeah, see, the war. I mean, now I understand everything. Uh, it's, it's one thing to use a scientific process to do evil. That's completely different. You can't really shun a scientist for that. But if you have the scientist basically lobbying for it, like basically wants to create a, a device that would hurt tons of people for the war or whatever, call it patriot, patriotic or whatever, but he's, the guy, he's a scientist. He's the leading guy in his field. And when you actively want to hurt people, that doesn't come right. It doesn't matter if it's war or not. So now it makes sense why people basically, you know, didn't attend this Nobel Prize award or whatever. Yeah, because Einstein was genius, right? I'm pretty sure Einstein could have figured out, you know, some of the ways to kill people better. He didn't, he didn't do that, right? Einstein was a really fucking genius. I mean, uh, he's one of the top of the food chain type of genius people. But he, he definitely could have come across with any d damaging type of thing. He didn't do that. So, yeah, I kind of see that. This is just fucked up. And, uh, you know, this is, I've seen lots of historical videos. I always said that, like, you know, Germans always have some kind of a technological edge. Obviously, that's because they had lots of leading scientists there, right? In Germany around the time. But Haber thought chemistry could make an even bigger contribution to the war. In December 1914, he witnessed a chemical weapons test. He was unimpressed. Haber believed that he could do better. He set out to make a gas that was deadly at low concentrations and heavier than air, Is so it? it would sink into enemy trenches. Is it? Projectiles carrying chemical weapons were banned, at least in theory, by the Hague Convention of 1899. But in practice, after the start of the war, Germany, France, and Britain all experimented with chemical weapons. Haber converted his wing of the institute into a chemical weapons laboratory, and after only a few months of work, he zeroed in on chlorine gas. An employee, Otto Hahn, expressed his discomfort about the new weapon. Haber told him, innumerable human lives would be saved if the war could be ended more quickly in this way. I mean, uh, okay, I guess. Uh, it's one way of looking at it, but it's still fucked up. At 6 p.m. on the 22nd of April, with the wind blowing toward the Allied trenches, Either German trailer. troops released 168 tons of chlorine from over 5,000 gas cylinders. The wall of gas advanced across the battlefield. Since chlorine gas is two and a half times heavier than air, it sank into the trenches of the Allied soldiers. Any soldier that inhaled a lungful of the gas suffered a terrible death. Chlorine irritates the mucus lining God. of the lungs so... Look, I mean, it's... Uh, there's a reason why 
any movie or anything you see is like, you know, make the death quick or something like that. Like, it's one thing, it's a war, you have to defend your country, you have to kill your enemy, sure. But the way you do it matters, right? There's a reason why torture is not, you know, considered moral for anybody, right? Regardless of where you are. Releasing a gas that slowly fucking hurt, you know, the opponent, slowly kills them, is as morally low there can be, right? So you can see why people like, okay, if you had some created a gun or something, that's still a different thing. But creating a gas that slowly kills people, I mean, that's just fucked up. I, I kind of knew like this is about World War One. he's a chemist, so I knew like this is going to the gas. He probably invented the gas that we know of World War One, right? It's a gas attack for fuck's sake. Violently, that they fill with liquid. The soldiers effectively drowned on dry land. More than 5,000 Allied soldiers died this way in the first attack. Damn. Haber was promoted to the rank of captain, and a week later he was back home in Berlin. On the 1st of May, the Habers hosted a dinner party. Come after the party wound down, Fritz took sleeping pills and went to bed. But that night, his wife Clara took his gun and went outside into the garden. And there she fired a single shot into her chest. What? Why? What does she have to do with anything? Her 12-year-old son, Herman, heard the shot and ran outside to find his mother as she lay dying. The next morning, Fritz Haber was on a train to the Eastern Front to... Because because he created the gas? Is that the reason? Goddamn. Imagine that, right? What you did is so atrocious that your wife basically, you know, sh shoots herself. This, this is some next level shit. Supervise a gas attack on the Russian army. But what about your kid then? Some have claimed Clara killed herself because of her husband's obsession with chemical weapons. And that may have been part of it, but honestly we don't know because no first-hand accounts survive that support this interpretation. I mean, to me it feels like that can't be the case, right? I understand he, she would basically, she would leave, leave him, something like that, right? Like, I can't be with you or whatever. But she's not the responsible, why would she shoot herself? That doesn't make sense. What we do know is that Clara was deeply unhappy in her marriage. Mm. In 1910, after being married for eight years to Fritz, she wrote... Wait a minute, she, has PhD, she had PhD in chemistry, right? So I guess as a chemist, chemist, chemistry, you know, scientist herself, I guess she felt shame at a level, like, you know, one of our own, basically her husband, basically used chemistry in this way, I guess that was too much for him or something, who knows? ...to a friend... What Fritz has won during these eight years, that and still more I have lost. And what remains ahead of me fills me with the deepest dissatisfaction. After Clara's suicide, Haber spent the rest of the war running his institute, researching chemical weapons, gas masks, and pesticides. By 1917, the institute employed 1,500 people, including 150 scientists, it was like a mini Manhattan project, but for chemical weapons. Damn. In total, 100,000 soldiers were killed by chemical weapons in World War I. When Germany surrendered, Haber was crushed. All the money he made from his ammonia patent was lost to hyperinflation. In an attempt to pay off Germany's crippling war debt, he tried to distill gold from seawater. But the project was futile. In 1933, the Nazis came to power and passed a law that all Jewish civil servants, including scientists, were to be fired from their jobs. Haber was Jewish, but he never <laughs> practiced the religion. Same. Regardless, his military service exempted him from the law, but he resigned from his role as director in solidarity with all the Jewish scientists who worked at the Institute. The next year, in a hotel room in Basel, Switzerland, he died of heart failure. Okay, fucking hell, that's heavy. Immediately after World War I, Haber's Institute developed a cyanide-based insecticide. 
It had a barely detectable odor, so they mixed in a foul-smelling chemical to alert people to the danger. The resulting gas was called Zyklon B. A decade after Haber's death, the Nazis requested chemists remove the foul-smelling component. And this form of Zyklon B, the chemical developed at Haber's institute, was then used to perpetrate the Holocaust. What the fuck? Even after his death, his things are being used like that. Thinking about this story, it would be easy to paint Haber as a villain or as a hero for inventing the process used to feed half the world. But another approach is to regard him as irrelevant to the larger story because someone else would have figured out a way to process nitrogen out of the air. Mm -hmm. And other scientists were developing chemical weapons. Over the past few centuries, science and technology have improved our lives immeasurably. But they have also... I mean, look, science is not just some word. Science is literally knowledge of everything. So if there is technology being made, whether in, you know, armaments or some other, like, you know, making your life easy, some form of scientist is doing that. So any time of weapons that were invented in the past were invented by some form of scientist. So obviously scientists are also the people who are creating this kind of a bombs and shit, right? I mean, uh, you know, I guess it was Oppenheimer who said that, like, you know, I've become death or whatever. So, you know, uh, basically it's, it's, it's not that only reason. But World War I is infamous for its gas attack, right? I mean, it's, it feels poignant. I don't know how else to say that, like, because of the gas. I mean, all the kind of attacks would be understandable. You know, but the gas attack feels like a, going a bit step too far, right? Killing people in that form. Like, that's just horrible. Like I said in the you know, middle of the video, like, uh, you know, in order to defend your country or fight for your country, you have to kill people. Understandable. But at the same time, how you kill them, like how, like gas attack, things like that, that's a bit too much. Also given us ever increasing ways to destroy ourselves. I think it'd be great to believe that we could ask scientists to only work on problems that are good for humanity. That's not how it works. But the reality is that every bit of information is a potential double-edged sword. You don't know the outcome of your research. Yeah, Hubble telescope is the best example of that, right? That's, that's how military and basic science goes hand to hand. Defense is the one place where countries will pour in money. That's what it happened with the Hubble, right? The f first time Hubble-like telescope was invented, that was to look inside the Earth, to spy on people by spy agencies. And then uh, NASA used that blueprint to you know, send Hubble in space. They did all these discoveries, right? So you can't really say, like, just focus on the good things, not bad things. That's not how things work. You don't know how the application is going to work out, right? Something good that you discover can be used for bad eventually. Or something that was in, you know, made to do something bad things could be used for something better, right? There is always going to be a spin-off somewhere. That's, science basically moves forward. Scientists, science doesn't see morality of things, right? It's eventually like, like in this video, like how he was working at a bulb factory. Right, and that's how he had access to do some things, and he made discovery. You don't know which part of what discovery is going to be helpful for what, or how it might later be used. Ammonium nitrate is both a fertilizer and an explosive. Mm. So the real question is, how do we keep increasing our knowledge and control of the natural world we can't. without destroying ourselves and everything else on this planet? We can't. Process. Yeah, we can't, right? I mean, look, unstable nuclear reaction is bomb. Stable nuclear reaction can be a reactor that provides energy for everybody, right? So, I mean, one thing is like a near unlimited energy and another thing is near unlimited destruction by the kind of, kind of the same process. So you can't really separate the, I mean, application will be what application will be. You can't really focus on how to do just good. You will restrict yourself at a limit that maybe you won't discover something along the way. 
So chemistry has made it possible for 8 billion of us to live on this planet and to have the standard of living that we do. But as a byproduct, we've changed the atmosphere and now we're suffering the consequences in the form of mm. more frequent and severe heat waves, among other things. Which brings me to an offer directly from me to you. I want to offset one month of your carbon emissions and I'll do it with this video's sponsor, Ren. On their website, you can calculate how much carbon you emit and which activities have the greatest impact. And if you like, you can offset your emissions through a monthly subscription. But they don't just plant trees. One of the projects they're currently backing is a pilot study in Scotland called Enhanced Mineral Weathering. So the way it works is they spread small basalt rocks throughout forested areas. And then when it rains, those raindrops contain dissolved CO2 in the form of carbonic acid. And when the rain hits the basalt, it reacts and the pH increases. Now that turns carbonic acid into carbonates, like calcium carbonate, and that precipitates out. So in this solid mineral form, the carbon is trapped potentially for thousands of years. Damn. And this is the kind of chemical innovation we may need to solve the climate crisis. Seriously. So if you want to join me in offsetting your carbon footprint, then click the link in the description. Yeah, man, I love this, right? <laughs> We need inventions like this. This is, you know, small things, right? but small things accumulate over time. So, yeah. All right, well, there was a scientist who killed millions and saved billions. Never heard of him, Fritz Heber. But apparently, he's the guy who made sure that, you know, food yield goes up. Populism rises up. You know, there, there were less hungry people, right? People were kind of, uh, you know, predicting that, like, in three decades, like in 1910 or something, uh, there, there will be food shortages. It didn't happen because of this guy. At the same time, we created basically World War One's gas attacks, right? That is infamous for being really like fucked up. So yeah, uh, this video was really interesting. Robbie Bob, if you like my reaction, don't forget to like, subscribe, and I'll see you next time.